throwing a snowball to your friends, putting a carrot on the snow person of yours, skating, and many more. It's the snowy winter spirit. Here's some facts about snow. Surprisingly, snow can come in different colors. Let's start with yellow snow. If it starts snowing when flowering trees are already in bloom, pollen is in the air too. Besides giving you allergies, it lands on snow-covered surfaces. In this scenario, snow blends with pollen, which results in this suspiciously yellow shade. The snow clouds can carry sand particles too. Yellowish-tinged snow was seen in South Korea in March 2006. The snow got the sand from the deserts of northern China. Pollen is oftentimes harmless, but sand-caused yellow snow isn't that innocent. It's related to air pollution. When NASA's Aura satellite detected this phenomenon, weather officials warned the public about the potential risks of this golden snow. Sometimes the color of the snow looks closer to brown, not even yellow. Certain trees, like oaks, carry a lot of tannins in the bark. These are organic compounds that protect the tree from harmful bacteria and funguses. These tannins can fall to the ground near the tree. For that to happen, it first needs to rain, and then the rain should turn into snow. The moisture makes the tannins run down. Have you ever just laid on the fresh snow and opened your mouth to let those tiny flakes in? How safe is it to eat those flakes, though? In most cases, it isn't. But here's a pro tip for snow eaters. The safest way to consume snow is by choosing a clean and white layer. Get some from the freshly fallen fluffiest part. And now, forget about it. You never know what random show in the street may contain. Blue tinted snow is the next one on the list. A cloudy day will create darker shadows. Snow absorbs all color wavelengths. Well, almost all color wavelengths. It cannot completely absorb blue. The bottom line is that bluish snow forms due to the weather conditions. I mean, the snowflakes are actually translucent since they're made up of ice crystals. These crystals reflect light. That's why in regular cases, snow appears white to our eyes. Gray and black snow also exist. Here, I'm not talking about melted snow mixed with dirt near the roads. The one I'm referring to is created with a dust coming from the volcano but it can be created with less exotic soot, ash, or motor vehicle exhaust. This type of snow is dirty. It might have a dusty or oily scent. If its color comes from petrochemicals, then it's probably toxic. The next one is watermelon snow. The name comes from the red and green color of the snow. Unlike other color versions, this one has a sweet and fruity scent. Different kinds of algae and bacteria produce watermelon snow. You would be very lucky to see it because it's seen during summer in alpine and coastal polar regions. The greenness comes from chlorophyll and the redness comes from astaxanthin. This is sort of a pigment. Fun fact, some animals such as flamingos, crabs, and salmon also get their color from that pigment. This phenomenon is super important ecologically. When the snow melts, it mixes into the waters and becomes a food source for organisms. Snow can come in different colors, but also different shapes too. An example would be snow rollers. To me, it looks as if someone is dragging an ice cream scoop through the ground. They are rare phenomenon because they need certain conditions to form. There should be wind, but it shouldn't be too strong. Typically, 30 miles per hour should do it. Yet, it depends on the snow too. It should be snowing, and how powerful the snow falls is another issue. Snow rollers occur in open prairies or hills with no obstacles like boulders or trees. It's a combo of two separate layers of snow. The first layer is the pre-existing sheet that crashed on the ground. The second one is a fresh layer of fallen snow. Imagine snow running down from the top of an ice rink, which doesn't hold on to what's under. Then, the wind carries some snow that is sticky enough to hold on to the things on its way. As the roller moves, it continues growing. If it's windy and there's an opportunity for rolling down a hill. Now, I want to move on to other cool facts about snow. For instance, it's silence. Do you know how freshly fallen snow absorbs sound? Especially if you live in a busy city, you realize it's the quieter ambience. It literally absorbs sound waves. Think of it as a commercial sound absorbing product. 
things change when it melts and refreezes. Then, the ice reflects sound waves. As a result, sound travels further, plus it gets clearer. It's not just us enjoying the snow. Apparently, some monkey species love it as much as we do. Japanese macaques, or snow monkeys, also make snowballs and play with them. Young macaques especially get attracted to snow. They steal one another's snowballs, then fight to get them back. Snow? Blizzard? What else? I can count some words related to snow, but the Inuit, for example, has dozens of words for snow. And Scots has 421 terms related to the snow. For instance, skelf is a large snowflake, and unbrack means the beginning of a thaw. From one point of view, there's the cold and the risk of hypothermia. From the other point of view, animal burrows or human igloos. We associate snow with cold, but it warms you up. Since snow consists of above 90% trapped air, it's a perfect insulator. We talked about snow itself, but what about snowflakes? The shape of a snowflake is bound to the air temperature around it. Researchers examined snowflakes and found out that long, thin, needle-like ice crystals form at around 28 degrees Fahrenheit. They also investigated other ice crystal samples taken from different temperatures. The flakes appear to be flat and plate-like in lower temperatures, such as 23 degrees Fahrenheit. The snowflake can also appear with six arms, or a dendritic structure as ice crystals, and that again depends on the changes in the temperature surrounding each snowflake. Maybe you heard the saying that no two snowflakes are identical. A catalog of snowflakes supports this theory. One chemistry educator detected more than 30 different types of snowflakes. They are classified as column, plane, rimmed, irregular, and so on. The reason for all this variety is the path each snowflake makes to fall to the earth. Each one of them faces a tiny bit of different atmospheric conditions on its way to the ground. All of them have six sides, that's for sure. But in 1988, a scientist found two identical snowflakes. Turns out, they can be identical. Snow can be seen in deserts too. I know it sounds super contradictory, we're accustomed to thinking about smoking hot sand, cactuses, and nothingness from a desert at first glance. In Death Valley or the Sahara Desert, snow is occasionally seen. In fact, in January 2022, some parts of the Sahara Desert got covered with a white blanket. It's not unlikely to happen all the time, but it's not impossible at all. You see, on some nights, the temperatures in the desert get low. Snow needs two things to form cold temperatures and moist air. Sahara put a tick on both of these conditions. Bonus fact, how long is the tallest snow figure? In 2008, Bethel town residents in the US united their forces with the people of surrounding towns to break a world record. The snow person was 120 feet tall. It took them more than one month to finish creating the figure. The Statue of Liberty was only a few inches taller than this figure. When we see a strong snowstorm, we call it a blizzard. That's not always so. You see, a snowstorm should meet some qualifications to be classified as a blizzard. For instance, the wind should be at least 35 miles per hour. Plus, the snow must decrease the visibility to a certain mile for three hours at the least. Otherwise, the snowfall can be named a snow squall or a snow burst. It's a snowy winter night. You're inside your cozy house and watching a historical movie that takes place during the Middle Ages. As you take another sip of your hot chocolate, you can't help but wonder how the people survived the winter back then. At that exact moment, your TV screen suddenly turns into a portal and pulls you inside! Whoa! You open your eyes to find yourself within the world of the movie you were just watching. A man approaches you and says, Welcome to my medieval village. I am Bartholomew, and I called you here to give you an answer to your question. First of all, let me tell you that conditions became extremely harsh when the cold arrives, and not just for the northern countries, 
Mainland Europe takes its share of the brutal weather too. So winter is kind of a slowing down time for all of us. You see, we usually associate winter with old age and poverty because of all the changes that occur in nature during this time. For example, we can't really grow any crops when snow covers all our land. And by the early 14th century, things started to get even worse because we started seeing the first signs of what you may know as the Little Ice Age. Cold temperatures peaked. Weather anomalies and extreme events such as sudden floods or hailstorms started to occur, which added to our agony. Take the winter of 1359, for instance. Across central Italy, the snow rose to extraordinary heights. People had to throw the snow into the streets to lighten up their roofs. And because of that, some towns were completely blocked. Their inhabitants were trapped in their homes for several days. Another example of this is the winter of 1389. The snowfall was so great in the Luzerne region of France that many people's farmsteads and houses were destroyed. Bartholomew notices that you start shivering. Ah, you were not prepared for this journey back to medieval winters, I see. Let's walk to my home and find you some warmer clothes. As you can see, I'm already wearing a cloak, a scarf, and mittens, which are all made out of wool. I also have boots that are made out of leather from a deer. Still, all these are not really enough to stay warm when one is outside. That's why we usually layer other clothes underneath them all to keep the warmth trapped. By the way, the wool can get heavy and itchy sometimes. So beneath our woolen outer clothing, we wear linen undergarments too. The linen acts as a barrier between the wool and the skin, therefore making things a bit more comfortable for us. It is also easier to wash linen clothes, and they dry way faster than woolen ones. The wealthier ones can line their winter clothing with fur, and us regular peasants sometimes use rabbit and lamb for the same purpose. It's not as glamorous, but still effective. We can also hunt some wild animals and birds with the permission of the Lord. Yet again, the sumptuary laws, in other words, consumption laws, are very clear on who can wear what according to their social standing. Take the 1363 English sumptuary law, for example. It states that the wives and daughters of craftspeople and land-owning peasants were only allowed to wear lamb, rabbit, cat, and fox furs. You notice a weird-looking hinged metal sphere in Bartholomew's pocket, and ask him what that is. Ah, it's a hand warmer, he says, as he gives it to you. If we are going to be outdoors for a long time, we bring one of these with us. Otherwise, one's fingers can get numb, you know. Now take a closer look at it, and you'll see that it has tiny holes on its surface. This helps the heat to escape, so that we can warm our hands without burning them once we fill it with hot coal. That's kind of heavy, you say and think about how lucky you are to be living in modern times. With just one click from the comfort of your home, you can order Hot Hands Instant Hand Warmers from Amazon, and no coal is necessary. You can even put those inside your shoes to warm your toes, since they're pocket-sized, unlike this metal orb. You and Bartholomew arrive at his house. You realize that he does not take any of his outer garments off. We keep everything on during the coldest months because the indoor heating isn't always great, he says. As you can see, the fireplace stands here at the center of our homes, and right above it, there is a ventilation hole rather than a chimney, which causes us to lose so much of the heat. Yet again, we don't usually sleep in our outside clothes. Instead, we put bricks and stones in the fire, wrap them in fabric, and take them to our beds to warm the sheets. Wearing our nightcaps all night long also helps. And when we're not sleeping, we usually try to stay close to the fireplace as much as possible. 
You sure appreciate that hot water bottle of yours more now, right? And you didn't even need to cover it with a cloth, like these folks have to do. It already came with a knit cover for your convenience. And the best part is, it's much softer than a brick and can be heated in the microwave within seconds. How rude of me. I forgot to offer you something to eat, Bartholomew says. I know I already told you winter means stillness for us, but we still need to put in some work to not starve. There's a lot of preparation to be done in advance to survive these medieval winters. First of all, we start gathering wood for the fire from as early as spring and through the summer. Then there's the food we harvest in the fall. We have to preserve that in a special way, so all will last over the winter months. The same thing goes for meat, too. The methods we use include pickling, drying, and brining. In terms of grains, cereals, and pulses, we dry them out and store them in ceramic or clay pots. We later use them for making potted stews and soups, in addition to vegetables. Basically, everything we can find goes into the pot. The most common foods we eat in our everyday lives include onions, peas, beans, lentils, and herbs such as parsley. We still have to include protein in our diet, though. And we do that by eating cheese, eggs, fatty bacon, or salted pork. In terms of fresh fruits and berries, they are hard to find during wintertime, so we preserve the ones we already picked by the air-drying method, too. You think to yourself, if only these people had a food dryer at home, their lives would be so much easier. They could use it for all the foods Bartholomew just mentioned, from fruits to meat. Then again, there's no electricity here. I wouldn't want you to think winters are so grim, long, and boring after everything I've told you. We still do plenty of activities to keep ourselves entertained, Bartholomew says. But what? It's not like they can binge watch their favorite TV shows. We play in the snow a lot, adults and children all together. You can see plenty of peasants ice skating on the frozen lakes. To be able to do that, we used to use pieces of polished wood or horse shin bones. But now, we have iron skates too. I need to mention though, here in Western Europe, ice skating is not as common as in Scandinavia. That is because they are more accustomed to snow and cold temperatures. Sledding is another fun activity we do. Then there are indoor games, such as chess, backgammon, and other dice games. Wool spinning and telling stories are also common ways to spend some nice time with our family. Not surprisingly, nobles have more opportunities in the entertainment area, too. For example, boar hunting is very common amongst the elite. At that moment, a portal appears at the door. Bartholomew says, Guess it's time for you to head back, traveler. Fare thee well. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.